Hello, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Coleman. I'm a teaching artist at Northern Clay Center in Minneapolis. And we have dusted off a series of lectures from a ceramic art history class that I taught a decade ago. Um, I've modified the lectures a bit so that um, high school teachers could use them. But if you wanna have students read along and you wanna teach it at the 400 college level as I did, um, we're using 10,000 Years of Pottery by Emmanuel Cooper and Susan Staubach's book. And so student reading completed prior to this lecture on the ceramics of the first historical civilizations. Um, the readings are listed here. If you are not interested in having your students read prior to the lecture for um, additional images and context, um, that's all well and good. And you can just start with the next image, which comes from Charlotte Spate or spite, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from her book called Hands in Play, which has a wonderful first section of history of ceramics, both art and technology. And I just wanted to put this up here to orient us um, visually to where we're, we're going to start off in Egypt, because that was kind of short shrift. Uh, in the prehistoric lecture. So um, we'll go there. First Historical Civilizations is the title. Um, we, we call them historical because they're the first civilizations that writing emerged. And so we're able to actually, once we've deciphered their language, read about that culture. And so instead of the um, immense guesswork that I've been referring to um, in past lectures, like we think this, we think that. Um, once hieroglyphics, for example, were de deciphered, we were able to read paintings from Egyptian tombs and actually figure out what they were doing um, and what certain things meant. We're going to start today in Egypt, um, but before we go there, I also wanted to talk about trade because during this time period, and this is labeled with current day names, so it's not historically accurate, but it is showing trade routes from the time period under discussion, which is roughly from uh, the beginning of the Bronze Age, so around 3000 BCE. Um, we have both maritime and land trace. Uh, the upper red one becomes the Silk Road, which we will talk about extensively in future lectures. But for purposes today, I think it's important for us to understand that Egypt um, and Persia and the Mediterranean um, were all um, those first civilizations that we're going to talk about, they were all connected either by land or by known maritime trade routes. So some things we know for certain about trade during this time period, um, the Badarian or Badarian culture of Egypt, um, based on artifacts that we find there, we know that they had distant contact with Syria, which would be where that little red thing forks, the, the far eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, in pre-dynastic Egypt, by the fourth millennium BCE, shipping was well established. And by also in the fourth millennium, we know that ancient Egyptians were importing pottery from, um, from Canaan. So uh, one other thing I want to point out, just so we can establish ourselves visually, is when we're talking about Egypt, we have to remember that the Nile runs from south to north. 
And so when we call, when we talk about Upper Egypt, we're not talking about the furthest place north. We're talking about the upper part of uh, the Nile River. And then the lower part, of course, is the Delta. Um, and then I've also been talking a little bit about the Nubian ceramics, and we'll talk about Kerma as well. So just for people to get a picture of where we are, um, so last lecture on prehistoric ceramics, I mentioned the Nubian eggshell ware, which is really, really fine and thin and fired in uh, pit kilns. And this is from the area of what would be called lower Nubia. So that, it's kind of weird because when it gets to Nubia, it reverses. So Lower Nubia is right next to Upper Egypt. And these two cultures um, conquered each other back and forth. Um, and then the trade routes, the Nakata culture emerged on the site north of modern day Luxor and spread throughout Upper Egypt. This was the most influential of all pre-dynastic civilizations and they practiced practiced the painted pottery technique similar to Anatolia, Mesopotamia, and Iran. We see geometric designs as well as animal and human forms. Recent archaeological findings reveal that symbols on Nakata pottery found at Gerzian resemble the traditional hieroglyphic forms. Also in a 1998 discovery, um, a tomb that belonged to a pre-dynastic ruler had 300 clay labels inscribed with proto-hieroglyphics dating to the Nakata period, which is 3300 BCE. So the Egyptians themselves were um, producing pottery like the pottery that they were importing. Um, this is a polished redware that is burnished. Um, and this is from the um, Badarian culture, which we talked about previously. It's from about 5000 BCE. It's thin walled and plainly shaped pots were made of carefully prepared red Nile clay and burnished with um, stone or uh, some other kind of tool. The Bedarian wares were often turned upside down and fired in an open pit so that the top of them is reduced and becomes blackened and the bottom remains reddish color of the clay. So these are also from Bedarian pre-dynastic Egypt. And this pot um, is a storage dryer, jar from Upper Nubia. Again, fired upside down. Um, the markings on it are um, meant to tell us what village it comes from, as well as what we would store in the pot. Um, and this kind of pot was made right up until uh, the Civil War in Somalia. Um, another really beautiful piece or type of ware that was produced in Lower Nubia um, are these drinking cups that were polished blackware with um, carvings to the white clay. The handmade cup shown here moved inside with fingers and the outer surface burnished with a smooth pebble. The black on the previous pot and this one is from reduction during firing. A reduction atmosphere is one where the oxy oxygen has been starved. So there's more fuel than oxygen 
and the fire needs, in order to continue, needs to take oxygen molecules from the clay. So red iron oxide becomes black iron oxide uh, where, where this reduction takes place. And it can be a local reduction in terms of smothering it with some kind of combustible material or by closing up the top of those updraft kilns we looked at um, in the last lecture. And I'll show you an image in a minute too. Um, so Egyptian pottery was, was often, um, you know, why, why invent when you can import? Um, it was often either very similar to or direct copies of things that were being made. And it's not until the, the dynastic period of the Middle Kingdom where the work, historians find the work to be innovative and um, specific to the Egyptian culture. This is a bell-shaped kerma beaker from the classic kerma civilization, which again was down in the, the area of the Nubia. So, but by this point, um, the Egyptian dynasties have consolidated both upper, lower, and Nubia into the one kingdom. These found stacked together in tombs in groups of as many as seven. And they are considered to be the outgrowth of a long Neolithic tradition of black topped, red polished ware. These are a zenith in ceramic technology for Egyptian art. Their production required a highly controlled kiln temperature and atmosphere. Uh, we also know that the Egyptians were using the pottery wheel by 2400 BCE. Although the early hand building techniques of coiling were never completely abandoned. This is a drawing based on an Egyptian carving and shows the god Kum using an early wheel. Uh, this is also an illustration from Charlotte Spate's Hands in Clay, as is this one, which are drawings from a tomb from the fifth dynasty in Egypt. Um, showing both loading and firing and then unloading kilns below and then above different kinds of ways that the potters would, would make them. And by this point, there's a wheel that an assistant could turn in the upper left corner so that the potter could concentrate with both hands on the clay. In the Old Kingdom of Egypt, around 2000 BCE, kilns were comprised of more sophisticated circular oval chimney-like structures of mud bricks, ranging in size from one to three meters across with a stoke hole on one side. The bricks on the floor were supported on a central wall or pillar in the middle of the firing chamber and the pots were loaded from the top with gaps left to allow the passage of hot gases. These are, these updraft kilns are very similar to the Neolithic kilns in Mesopotamia, but they're cylindrical rather than dome-shaped. One of the best contributions of Egyptian ceramic art to contemporary, art, contemporary understanding of glaze is the invention of what we now call Egyptian paste, or um, this is a statuette of a hippopotamus from the Middle Kingdom, 1980 to 1800-ish 800, BCE. It's famous, um, the Metropolitan made it uh, an ambassador of sorts and printed it on everything. Um, it's about four inches long, but from advertising and stuffed animals, it has grown in stature, which is appropriate, I think, based on um, 
the amazing invention of Egyptian paste. So this kind of paste is considered the first glaze. It's made by mixing soluble sodiums with ground sand made of quartz and a little clay for adhesion. The soluble salts are a flux, and because they're soluble, they come to the surface of the form. When it's fired, it creates a glassy coating on the wear. The body of this hippo was also painted with black slip to create the outlines of river plants, symbolizing the marshes in which the animal lived. A little bit of copper added to the Egyptian paste would make the glossy surface turn bright blue. So we call this an Egyptian blue. The paste often was used in place of lapis lazuli, which the Egyptians were, would have to import from uh, what's present day Iran. The seemingly benign appearance that this figure presents is deceptive and also I find it humorous given the Metropolitan's use of it as a big cuddly stuffed animal um, because to the ancient Egyptians the hippopotamus was one of the most dangerous animals in their world. The huge creatures were a, ha a hazard for small fishing boats and other river craft. The beasts might also be encountered on the waterways in the journey to the afterlife. As such, the hippopotamus was a force of nature that needed to be controlled both in this life and the next. And we, this piece was discovered um, from an Egyptian tomb. So it was something that someone took into the next life. Also in tombs of kings from Egypt, we have found these Shabti figures that are made of Egyptian paste. A Shabti is a funerary figure that is buried with someone to be their servant in the afterlife. Um, so they're, they're one of the first instances of substitution burial. Um, rather than taking your servants with you, you would have these little statues in your tomb to do your bidding in the afterlife. The one on the right is from CT1's tomb from the Valley of the Kings um, and the 19th dynasty. It dates from 1290 BCE. On the left, we've got a Shabti with a coffin inscribed uh, the pinnacle of Egyptian pottery comes during the 18th dynasty or 3380 BCE with these ritual vases that were thrown on a fast moving pottery wheel. And the very large, income, this is 32 inches high, um, it was painted pottery made for the use of the court for religious purposes. It's very large and complex, demonstrating the technical skill of the potters. After the pots had been fired, they were painted with floral motifs, geometric patterns, hieroglyphics in red, blue, white, and black pigments that were unfired. So in terms of our um, development of surfaces, the Egyptians give us Egyptian paste and the first copperish glaze, but also um, the idea of painting with pigments and then not firing it. Just wanted to come back to this because we're going to move to the Minoan civilization, which was located on the island of Crete. And then in the part two of the lecture, we'll talk about the Mycenaean civilization which was located um, on the Peloponnesus of Peninsula of Greece. So we're going to look across the Mediterranean, only about halfway to the island of Crete, where the civilization, Minoan civilization, was named after King Minos, the legendary king of Crete. Presumably there was an actual king, but no historical documents have been found yet attesting to his existence. 
This Bronze Age culture produced magnificent palaces at Knossos and Phaestos. They're also known for wall paintings and sculptures while giving ceramics an important place, producing distinctive vessels and terracotta figurines. Grain, oil, and other foodstuffs for the palace were stored in large jars called pithoi. The maze of underground storerooms that held these pithoi may have been the basis of the Greek legend about a labyrinth where the half bull, half man, Minotaur, roamed, demanding human sacrifice. The ancient pithoi on the right survives, survived the fire that destroyed the palace in 1450 BCE. And they're shown here still in the storeroom. And the image on the left is there for um, scale so that you can see exactly how big they are. Six feet tall, this one. Our knowledge of early Minoan Crete comes primarily from burials and a number of excavated settlement sites. While shielding the islanders from attack, the sea enabled the Minoan culture to trade with Mesopotamians in Greece, as well as the Cycladic islands in the Aegean. Cretan exports consisted of timber, foodstuffs, cloth, olive oil, and wine as well as finely crafted luxury goods. In exchange, the Minoans imported tin, copper, gold, silver, fine stones, and ivory. For basic needs, however, the Minoans on Crete were self-sufficient. Oil and wine were exported in pottery vessels and a wide variety of forms were made. Tall stemmed cups for wine, handled bases, pitchers, teapots, large storage jars and graceful jugs, like the one on the left, which is called Kamara Square. It's about 10 inches tall. And then the pithoi on the right is four feet. The Kamara Square was found in the Kamara's caves, where the most splendid of these jars were found. They're painted with black, white, and orange pigments prior to firing. These elegant and delicate pottery forms with boldly painted designs are also outstanding from a technical point of view. On the, on the left, a jug with abstract wave-like swirls and what may be a jellyfish with floating tentacles. And on the right, an orange fish with waves and nautilus seashells. So the Kamaras Ware is known for its amazing design as well as color. This is a vase that was found at a pal in a palace on Crete. And probably if any Minoan ceramics were shown during your art history survey course, this one was, was one of them. It's, it's called the octopus vase. And it's just inspiring for decoration in terms of it moving around the form. So that they, the Minoans drew inspiration from living forms and translated them into decorations that were freely drawn and painted with black, white, and earth pigments. Palm trees, octopi, flowers, leaves, dolphins, and shells served to accentuate the curves of the vases and the jars. Some people think the decoration is a little bit overwhelming and that it distracts the eye from the shape of the best vessel. But at its best, that decoration is flowing and harmonious as with this one. The octopi encircle and emphasize the curving form of the vessel. The Minoans also created rhytons, which are upside down wine vessels. So the wine is poured into what neck of the, usually a bull, um, and in, you can't put it down because there's no flat spot. So encouraging lots of drinking of wine. This is from 
the late Minoan period around 1400 BCE. The Raitan is articulated with mottled ears and horns. Painted slips indicate the forelock and dark markings on the animal's hide. The potters on Crete, um, the Minoan potters also created vessels for uh, perfume and cosmetics. This one um, has twin lifting handles, except for its lid, which is destroyed. It's remarkably well preserved. Its shape is a less common variation of the characteristic Minoan pyxis that usually has a slightly taller cylindrical body. This one is 10 inches tall. The stylized snakes on the decorative panels are more likely related, more than likely related to the snake goddess of Minoan civilization. There she is in all her, all her glory. Uh, this was found in Knossos, Crete in 1600 BCE. It's 13 and a half inches and technically um, quite astounding. The, the famous snake goddesses from Knossos belong to the New Palace period. Besides the ritual function, they're among the best examples of dominant features of Minoan art, naturalism and grace. They are presented as ladies of the palace court, dressed in typical Minoan clothes with a long skirt and a tight open bodice. The snakes crawl around on the body of one of the goddesses and appear in each hand of the other. These statuettes are interpreted sometimes as the goddess and her votary, the mother goddess and her daughter, or the human attendants of the goddess. Previously, the snake goddess was thought to be one of the Minoan divinities associated closely with the snake cult. She was also called the household goddess due to the snakes, which are connected with welfare the welfare of the Minoan house. But the snake is also symbolized, but also symbolic of the underworld deity and something, she also had something to do with rebirth because sh snakes shed their skin. At the present time, there are discussions reinterpreting the functions of the snake goddess. Linear B, um, a language of Mycenaean or early Greek culture has been deciphered, but the language we call Linear A of Minoan Crete has not yet been fully figured out. We hope to know about, more about the snake goddess and Minoan religious practices once it is deciphered. Uh, this is an example of a jug from Minoan Crete, and I tried to get close enough so that you could see what's called in linear A that's incised at the top. And again, probably we see it as decoration, but at the time it was also writing decipherable to whoever would purchase or use this jug. That concludes part one of lecture three.